It's still independent celebration here in Nigeria, and we're bringing you markets, analysis, and insights here on Business Incorporated, live from Channels Television. Here's what's coming up. A look at trends in Nigeria's capital market from independence to date. An African Development Bank launches climate change country by country report ahead of COP28. And Mozambique bonds rally after settlement on tuna debt scandal. Welcome to the program. I'm Will Ivong. Happy Independence Day from Nigeria. Let's kick off with the markets. First up, major equities in Africa. At intraday, major equities were trading uh, in the red. Uh, Nigeria's NGX, however, is closed for the Independence Day holiday. Meanwhile, we see it's ending Friday's session in the red there. But South Africa at intraday today was trading uh, down 0.05%. Now let's see Egypt. The EGX 30 was trading negative at intraday as well. It was down more than 1%. While Kenya closed Friday's session in the red, still on its losing streak. Now we'll have a quick review of Nigeria's capital markets, looking at trends and impacts of different government policies, administrations, how it's impacted the growth of the capital market, equities and fixed income from independence to date. We have Vincent Oshoma, is the head of capital market, Interstate Securities Limited, joining us virtually. Good afternoon, Vincent. It's good to have you in the program. Good afternoon. Happy Independence. It's my pleasure. Happy Independence to you too. Uh, in the Vincent, Nigeria is celebrating 63 years of independence, uh, 63 years of business, 63 years of capital market activities. How would you assess um, the capital market space from 1960 to date? Yeah, I will say that the capital market space, the capital market has done well uh, from 1960 to date. Looking at from the beginning of when the market was launched, the stock exchange from 1961 and uh, some equities were introduced, including bonds. But you remember that the first uh, capital market transaction started around 1949 by the colonial government. And from 1961 to date, we have seen a lot of improvement, a lot of growth in the market and a lot of impact. The market that we, we were impacted the Nigerian economy a lot. It has provided a platform for capital formation for the Nigerian economy. And we have seen growth in the market and there is a lot of impact in the market. I will mention some major events that we have recently that can, we have seen the market impacted the, the economy. We talked about the banking capitalization where, where the, the, new minim, the new minimum uh, capital was, uh, was established for the bank. A lot of the money that was raised by that time was raised from the capital market and it led to the stability of the bank. And when we saw the, the, bank, the government trying to transform the power sector, by with the discos, a lot of the money that was raised in the purchase of the license were uh, diversification by the government, by private uh, investors that invested in the by power sector, were from the banks, and it was based on money that was raised uh, upon the recapitalization. So you have seen a lot of impact in the economy and also providing jobs. Most of the major, major companies you have in the country that are paying a lot of tax, they are listed in the markets and they have come to the market to raise money both in terms of equity and also in terms of uh, debt. So in terms of the impact, we say that the Nigerian capital market has made a lot of impact in the Nigerian economy and it has come a long way from the mm. Interesting, interesting development there. But we're looking at Nigeria's debt markets, that's the bond market, fixed income spaces. It's been a go-to for Nigeria's government in terms of uh, funds raising, you know, to, you know, meet the budget deficits we have. But what policies, what government policies over the years have been, you know, has changed, has been a, a game changer for the capital market? Yeah, I will, if, if, we, if you look at the history of the capital market, there are several landmark uh, events. One, we talked about the first commission that was uh, set up around uh, in the 60s. I think the uh, Paris Okibo Commission that led to this, because when the capital market started, it was a part of the CBN. But well, that commission led to setting up the Security and Exchange Commission as a commission independent of the CPN to manage the capital market. And you also talked about the, uh, the ODF uh, commission that led to the uh, ISA that is setting up an Investment and Securities uh, Act and also the Investment and Securities Tribunal. These are major landmarks. We also mentioned the fact that the, the coming up of uh, uh, KAMA, the uh, capital uh, market, uh, the Communities and Allied Market Act, also helped in the development of the private sector. Uh, in Nigeria. And so those are landmarks events in uh, Nigerian's history and uh, the private sector, which also have an impact on the capital market. 
Oh, we're we'll still talking about different events, different uh, policy formation, different laws that have come in. Those are very important, as well as the, the recapitalization of the banks that I mentioned earlier. So what, what policies so far, what has worked and what do you think will work for Nigeria's capital market to go you know, above board? Because right now, yes, we're doing well, second best in Africa, but what do you think it lacks? What's that thing that needs to be changed? That maybe a policy formation or something else that would make that our capital market stand straight? Because right now, you know we are on, on unclassified status according to the FTSE Russell. What is that thing? We know we need to solve the FX problem, but what else do domestic players as well as institutional players, foreign players need to do, or policymakers, the stakeholders in the capital market need to do? What change do we need to move Nigeria's capital market forward? One of the things that I think we need to bring in the capital market is I talk about policy formation and a more partnership with the gov more government support. Because when you when you look at it, you talked about uh, having a, the right environment. Like when you talk about the Nigerian economy is the biggest economy in Africa. But when you talk about the percentage of our of the capital market compared to our GDP, you can see that our GDP is lower than our, uh, our capital market, the size of our capital market is lower than the GDP. Compared to the South African market where the uh, capital market is like more than three times, about three times the GDP of the economy. So we need a lot of government support, government participation, policies that we have in driving growth in the market. When you talk about one of the major times of growth in the market, we talk about the early 2000s, and it has to do with the policy of the administration. When you talk about the privatization policy that led a lot of companies to get listed in the market, as well as the bank recapitalization, and also the capitalization in the insurance sector, as, not, as well as the power sector policy reformations, uh, policy, policy that came up then, it led to growth in the capital market because when you have some policies and uh, those uh, companies are looking at ways can raise money to take advantage of new government policies, a lot of them come to the market. It also helps listed companies to explore those opportunities. I think it has to do with uh, partnering, the gov more government support. Like now, now, there are talks about the NNPC being listed. I think if we get companies like the NNPC being listed on the Nigerian boards, I think it will help in the growth of the capital market as well as also companies that are in the power sector we need to see more uh, listing in the area like you look at nigerian economy a major part of nigerian economy is the oil and gas sector we need to see more listing of companies in the oil and gas sector so that nigerians can take advantage of the opportunities in that sector i think those are more things that we need to see and in terms of policy growth in the, in the system because without we really having the policies that can stimulate growth both in the economy we cannot see growth in the uh, the uh, in the capital market because the capital market is a part is environmental yeah, they usually say is what's used to measure growth in the economy so if we don't see growth in the economy we cannot really see growth in the capital market Thank you so much, Vincent Toshoma, Head Capital Market Interstate Securities, for giving us those perspectives. And we hope that Nigeria uses this time to, you know, ruminate and probably come up with new policies or revisit old policies that would move the country and the economy forward. Thank you so much for joining us on Business Incorporated. And now Thanks, let's go over to the EU, where the European Union has launched the first phase of the world's first carbon border tariff from October the 1st. Exporters will have to, you know, report their tax, their carbon tax, to the EU authorities. Where well, we have more from Dolce Veles, uh, Chimponda Chimbelu giving us more insights there. Chimponda, how will the EU's new carbon tariff work? Thanks for having me. The new tariff is called the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. So with it, the EU aims to put carbon standards for goods made in the bloc and those from abroad on an equal footing by 2026. It complements the emissions trading system. Now, since 2005, the EU has set caps on emissions that industry is allowed to emit every year. And companies are allowed to trade allowances amongst themselves. So the carbon border adjustment mechanism will complement the system, but it will target foreign companies from six carbon intensive industries, including cement, iron and steel and aluminum. Now, the first phase kicked in 
yesterday, so on Sunday, all companies exporting goods into the EU from the six carbon intensive industries will need to report their emissions to EU authorities. In 2026, the EU will introduce a tariff on products that do not meet the bloc's emission standards so that they can compete on an equal footing with products that are made in the EU, which of course are subject to the emissions trading system. Well, what has been the response from other countries? Well, as can be expected, there is some resistance from other countries against the carbon border adjustment mechanism. The bloc's major trading partners, Russia and China, have said that it goes against the principles of free trade, and there's also been some tension between Brussels and Washington. The U.S. wanted to get an exemption for its steel and aluminum exports to the EU. But EU authorities are concerned that making an exemption for U.S. steel and aluminum would break World Trade Organization rules. And we may actually end up seeing the WHTO weigh in on whether the EU's carbon border adjustment mechanism is legal in international trade. Analysts expect it to be challenged by exporters to the EU who may say that their products are being discriminated against by the bloc. And it's not just the countries that are concerned. Here in Germany, critics say it will lead to more bureaucracy and paperwork. Now, that's at least what we've been hearing from the chemical and auto industries in particular. They, as importers of goods from carbon-intensive industries, would be subject to the rules when bringing the products into the EU. European producers who rely on foreign suppliers for some goods are concerned that they may simply end up losing suppliers because foreign producers that do not adhere to the rule may be precluded from exporting to the EU. But European authorities are hoping that the first phase encourages the countries where the foreign producers are based to create laws that incentivize lower emissions. Now, I know Nigeria's NGX is closed here in Nigeria, but what can we expect from the markets today in the EU? Well, European markets are making modest gains after a very rough September. Investors are relieved that the threat of a U.S. federal government shutdown has been averted at least until mid-November. Markets are desperate for positive news after the challenging month we had last month. But analysts do not expect today's economic data dump in Europe to lift sentiment. A round of purchasing managers index data is expected and August Eurozone unemployment figures will also be released today. Thank you so much, Chimponda Chimbelu, Deutsche Welle's correspondent there with those insights from Berlin. Thank you so much. Now, more stories, this time from the African continent. Do stay with us. This is Business Incorporated. Thanks for staying with us. We're still celebrating Nigeria's Independence Day and the country is turned 63 yesterday on October the 1st. But the country's uh, inflation rate is still at over 25%. And Lagos, the commercial city, has been adjudged the most expensive city in the country to live in, according to inflation rate. I visited many, uh, I visited a low-income family in, in Lagos, some part of Lagos State, to see how they're coping, how the struggle has been for them. Let's take a listen to the report. In the heart of Lagos, a resilient community faces a relentless adversary, rising prices and soaring inflation. Today, we share the story of the Amadisons, emblematic of countless families facing this economic storm. Oh, you're yeah, welcome. Thank you. Good to have you. Thank you. And these are children? Yes, they are. This is my Hello. husband. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much. Please come Oh, thank you so much. A hard-working couple with four young children, aged seven, five, three, and a seven-month-old baby. Welcome. They rely on the father's income as a cleaner to get by. I'm into industrial cleaning. A new building, I do the cleaning. Like, for example, they just finish a, a, a building. I do the cleaning, the window, just everything, both the floor. You understand? So all the trash, we take it off. For the Amadisons, inflation isn't just a number, it's a daily struggle. Let's say that 30 or 40 comes, we should just write out the list we need, the most important. It's not as if everything is not important, but the most important, especially for the kids, the electricity be I pay 7,000 to 10,000 naira per month. Then the school fees, I pay 90 to 100,000 in a term. It's not really easy, it's, you know, we're just struggling. It's really telling on my family, understand? Compared to what I do for a living, it's not that easy. 
they have to manage my rice i managed to buy beans i managed to to buy gari managed to blend my obono egusi pepper i don't buy their beverage i don't buy their biscuits in bulk now i buy little i'll give them 100 naira. okay go and buy after three kids okay 50, 50 naira you know and i get sachet of milo for them <laughs> Just like most Nigerians, rising prices have greatly impacted their spending. How much for that one now? One, one. This is apple now. This is a fifty naira before now. No, no, one fifty. Have I given me? In 2021, this quantity of tomatoes sold for 500 naira. By 2022. It had reduced to this amount and today the story is completely different it has not been easy it has uh, really brought down the level of um, <laughs> the way my cooking the things i used to prepare for my children I will, i'm no longer able to prepare that i need to bring down the things i use like my ingredients i used to bring i need to bring them down to be able to prepare something just prepare something for them Beyond feeding, their medicines spend an average of 43,966 naira on rent, electricity and gas per month. This, according to Mr. Madison, is quite high as his income remains unchanged. Uh, my income has not increased despite the way things are, things are so hard. If I do, I will lose my clients. We are not really finding it easy to pay my children's school fees. But what we we'll do? Once uh, we have some amount of money, we go, we talk to the proprietors. Once money comes in, we balance up. To get by, families here depend on assistance from local groups such as the Community Compassion Initiative, CCI, for the children's educational materials. Uh, every year, for example, we carry out um, the back to school project where we you know, provide backpacks for the children and stuff these backpacks with um, resources and all the materials that the children need for school, including books. We provide shoes. We observed that many of the children, you know, don't wear school um, shoes to school. Recent data from the National Bureau of Statistics shows Lagos is one of the top 10 most expensive states to live in in Nigeria, based on inflation rates. This could give rise to shanties if not checked. Social safety net in reality is that is because you cannot survive on your own, the government provides that support for you. But essentially, the, the best social safety net is actually to create employment, create jobs, and cre increase productivity, skills of people. That's a, that's a long-term project. The reality is that we have to deal with this at the local level, right? And you, you do not institutionalize uh, a parasitic society. In other words, people have to be able to fend for themselves. Responding, the Commissioner for Information says the Lagos State Government is set to support 500,000 households as part of its palliatives package and other initiatives. There have been direct interventions in uh, so many areas for Lagosians not to be able to feed too much the pangs and pains of uh, Inflation, for example, the the uh, Mr. Biden's old administration has increased the salaries of uh, workers by 20 percent, and the implementation began in January. The challenges facing the Madison family is indicative of a larger crisis and reveals the harsh realities for many low-income communities in various parts of the country. But the big question is, what can be done? to alleviate the burden of inflation on vulnerable families, not just in Lagos, but across Nigeria. From the Ikota community here in Lagos, Will Ibong, the channel's television news. That's a uh, development there. And the uh, latest development from the federal government yesterday during Independence Day uh, pronouncement, the federal government did announce, the president announced that increase for public servants in their salaries and wages. We're hoping that that will alleviate some of the problems and the issues 
when it comes to inflation in the country. Now, we move on to other stories. Ahead of the 28th United Nations Conference on Climate Change, the COP28, the African Development Bank Group has launched a country-by-country -country economic report to guide African policymakers in their discussions at the global event. The reports contain short, medium, and long-term policies to accelerate African countries' economic growth and build resilience to shocks, providing governments and potential investors with up-to-date, accurate data to inform policy and investment decisions. The reports also foster policy dialogue on macroeconomic performance and outlook and provide insights on mobilizing private sector and natural capital finance to drive the continent's climate resilience and green growth policies. And that's a wrap on Business Incorporated for this edition on our Independence Day celebration. I am Will Ibong. Thanks for watching. I will see you tomorrow.